overwhelming majority of American mothers with whom I talk that, uh, quote, this is the hardest thing they've ever done, end quote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I point out to them as often as I am able to do so uh, through whatever venue uh, at the moment, that uh, this is something that uh, your grandmother would not have said, your great-grandmother would not have said, why do you think you're saying it? It's great. It's a great honor, really, to talk to you. Oh, um, you yeah, we uh, so I've been reading your books for 25 years or so. Uh, we were handed, I think it was parent power back when we had our first child, which was 1990. Well, our first was born in 1997. And um, we were, my mother-in-law gave me your book and you have just been a, um, a great influence and a benefit for all of us. And I uh, appreciate uh, all of the work that you've done. So we're familiar with you, but maybe not everybody in, in my audience would be familiar with you. So it might be wise if you would just give a quick brief introduction of yourself and, and let everybody know a uh, little bit of your background and how you got started kind of doing what you're doing. Sure. Uh, where do I begin? Well, in 1976, I began writing a newspaper column. I was the uh, pro I was one of several program directors at a local community mental health center in North Carolina. And uh, quite serendipitously, um, I began writing a newspaper column on healthy child rearing practices uh, as they were understood at the time within the uh, mental health community and um, began to realize after about four years of this that uh, what the mental health professions were telling parents concerning the raising of kids was significantly wrong. It was significantly mistaken. And it was based on unproven theories uh, that ran counter to common sense and ran counter, especially to traditional understandings of children and child rearing, and began at that point to incur the ire and wrath of um, my colleagues in the mental health professions. I am a psychologist by license uh, from the North Carolina Psychology Board, 1978. And uh, um, my licensing board subsequently, uh, as I followed the arc of this departure and this arc of new understandings uh, concerning the raising of kids, new in the sense that they ran very counter to everything that uh, the mental health professions were telling parents uh, about such things as self-esteem and uh, communicating with children and the importance of children's feelings and so on and so forth. Um, my licensing board began to come after me with a vengeance and uh, tried subsequently over the next uh, 15 years to take my license away three times, a license that they had given me, a license mm -hmm. that I had earned, um, <clears throat> not because I had done something wrong, but simply because I was not thinking correctly, according to them. Right. And I was broadcasting my unorthodox uh, thoughts uh, to the public through my newspaper column. So I like to tell people with some sense of pride that I was uh, a quote unquote victim of cancel culture because <laughs> the, before the term was even coined. And um, so 
began writing books in the 1980s and wrote a bestseller in 1989 called The Six Point Plan for Raising Happy, Healthy Children, began getting a lot of requests for public speaking, left private practice at that point to focus exclusively on writing and public speaking. And uh, that's been my career ever since, has been writing and public speaking uh, about uh, the raising of children, what we now call parenting. And um, I'm, I'm a certified heretic in the mental health professions. I, um, it is significant for our audience to know that I disagree with everything, not most things, everything. Mm -hmm. that the uh, mainstream and the mental health communities and the mainstream encompasses probably 99% of people in the, in the profession uh, says and has been saying for the last 50 years concerning the rearing of kids. Mm -hmm. uh, so great, great thought there. Well, let me ask you this question. What was the point of departure? Like, it seems as though there was a point historically uh, where there was a shift away, um, where you started to realize this stuff was going on. What was the point, in your opinion, of departure with maybe conventional thinking or traditional thinking or uh, traditional values in parenting uh, that started to move things away to the point where we are where we are today? And, I, and I'm going to just make the assumption that you would assume where we are today is just the result of this uh, kind of, you know, maybe it's postmodern thought or whatever it is on parenting and self-esteem and all of those things that have led us to a situation, I think, where we are kind of reaping um, the whirlwind of all of that uh, thought and all of that ideology when it comes to parenting. So what, what was the point of departure from your perspective? Point of departure took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, we began listening at that point to mental health professionals and other people with capital letters after their names tell us how to raise kids. And I was in graduate school at the time and uh, was led to believe vis-a-vis uh, -vis that experience, Jeff, that uh, we had uh, discovered, we being mental health professionals, uh, had discovered um, things about children and things about parental responsibilities and how to raise children properly to maximize their emotional functioning, to maximize their social functioning, uh, their behavioral functioning, et cetera, et cetera, that previous generations of American parents did not know uh, that previous generations of American parents had labored in ignorance concerning children and proper child rearing. And we presented ourselves to the American public as the saviors of child rearing. And um, within a span of time that was less than a decade, um, this new parenting paradigm had uh, grabbed America by the throat and um, had succeeded in, in turning what had been a, a very simple, straightforward process into something very uh, complicated, stressful, um, and, and a, as testified to by the overwhelming majority of American mothers with whom I talk, that, uh, quote, this is the hardest thing they've ever done, end quote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I point out to them as often as I am able to do so uh, through whatever venue uh, at the moment, that uh, this is something that uh, your grandmother would not have said, your great-grandmother would not have said, why do you think you're saying it? And the answer is, well, John, times have changed. And I point out, well, times have always changed. Uh, times, in fact, have changed uh, culturally uh, in, in more radical ways in the past in this country uh, than they have in the last 30 or 40 years. So right. think the early 
uh, 20th century. Think, um, think the, uh, the time of the revolution. I mean, uh, there have been dramatic uh, social, cultural, uh, demographic, economic changes in America before, but the one thing that never changed was the set of understandings that informed how the family operated, including how children were reared. And all of that, uh, I mean, all of it, Jeff, um, all of those understandings were torn apart, deconstructed in the late 60s and early 70s. And we set off down, uh, to paraphrase Robert Frost, uh, we set off down a road never traveled. Right. And this uh, road has uh, led us into mixing my references now, Dante's Dark Wood. <laughs> and uh, people people have begun to think that um, a high level of stress uh, is normal to the raising of children, a high level of parental stress. People have begun to think that uh, behavior on the part of children that was unheard of 70 plus years ago is normal to children, eight-year-olds throwing tantrums in public places. Uh, eight-year-olds hitting their parents when they uh, when their parents do not give them what they want, uh, things of that sort. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, I'm 75 years old, uh, and, and I think a very sound mind. When I was growing up, um, uh, it, it, it was unheard of. I mean, I didn't know. I didn't right. know anybody, anybody in my peer group who ever stood up to an adult teacher, parent, police, policeman, neighbor, anybody, and said, where's the effect of, I'm not going to do what you just told me to do. I'm not going to do right. it. You have no authority in my life. But there was no such thing. And the interesting thing is, and, and the dark secret that uh, the mental health professions in America will not acknowledge, will not talk about, is that since we began listening to psychologists and other mental health professionals, remember, I am one, uh, tell us how to raise kids, the mental health of children has deteriorated to by a factor of at least 10. Right. Today's child is 10 times more likely by conservative estimate based on research uh, to experience by age 16 a serious emotional setback, 10 times more likely than was a teenager in my day and time in the late 50s, early 60s. Now, do you think that that's because, well, obviously it's a different environment we're in. Um, there was a book written by Neil Postman called The Disappearance of Childhood. I don't know if you've read that or not. He makes the, yeah. So in that he makes the case that there was a shift when um, technologies moved away from literacy was kind of the barrier that prevented kids from entering into adulthood. Um, his, his point is we're in a different mediated environment where kids are now exposed to more information. So is it the fact that kids are now exposed to more trauma that they were maybe protected from in the past? I don't know if that's necessarily the case in my own opinion, or is it the fact that there is no development of resilience? I work as a head of school. Um, we deal with, with mental trauma, anxiety, stress, depression every day. Uh, we've got kids that are struggling. Um, and I, I, I was talking with a group, we were talking about mental health from, you know, mental health and trauma and stress and anxiety and everything like that from, um, from COVID, you know, coming out of that. And I started to think this is not, even that we're, even though we're in this situation, there have been other, other traumatic times in our history where people were sent off to war, where, where kids knew their brothers were maybe not coming back, take World War II, go back. 
they experienced stress, they experienced trauma, they experienced hardship, great depression. We didn't know where we're getting our next meal. Yet there was a different type of resiliency, it seems to me back then. And those people grew up. Those were my grandparents that came out of those eras that grew up healthy, stable, able to walk through society, able to handle difficulties. And yet now we're, you know, the first sign of somebody not being able to do something where, you know, there's somebody in the fetal position in the corner and we're, you know, finding where are the professionals? Let's get them into a, you know, let's get them into a program. So, you know, what's, uh, how, how have we get, gotten to this point? You know, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, that's a pretty broad question, Jeff. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll deal with one aspect of it. And sure. We can go from there. Um, uh, uh, as I travel the country as a public speaker and, and even, you know, just recreationally, I, I run into people my age and, and I take polls in various demographics so when I come across a person my age who seems interested in the topic um, of raising children, which many, many people in my generation are because what we're seeing uh, culturally is incomprehensible to us. Um, it's not incomprehensible to me, I understand it, but uh, most people my age don't understand it. Right. Um, and uh, one of the questions I ask of people in my demographic, uh, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, is uh, do you remember ever having a conversation with your parents about your feelings? And the typical response is a burst of laughter. And um, the, uh, the, when the person speaks, uh, it, it, to paraphrase the typical response, it's, uh, uh, John, my parents weren't really interested in my feelings for the most part. Uh, we never had a conversation about my feelings. Um, and uh, then I ask, well, are, looking back, are you okay with that? And and they say, well, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm 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 fine today. I've I've been fine. Uh, I, I don't feel that uh, convers the lack of conversation about my emotional state at any given point in time was a negative in my upbringing. Um, one of the things that uh, that mental health professionals told parents they needed to do was talk to their children about their feelings, talk to them about their feelings, help them clarify their feelings, help them learn how to functionally express their feelings. And all of this sounds wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's an idea that's easy to market. It's very palatable. It's sort of, uh, it's, it's intuitive. And uh, yet, the more we have talked to children about their feelings, the more emotionally chaotic they have become. And one of the things that I tell parents all the time is the more you talk to a child about his feelings, the more feelings he's going to have. And feelings are very constructive things at some level. But to communicate to a child that every feeling he has is valid, meaningful, significant, needs to be talked about, needs to be explored, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, that at some point crosses a line where the child becomes so feeling-oriented and so feeling-obsessed, probably is a better way of putting it, that they can no longer control their feelings. Their feelings are, to use a word you used earlier, their feelings become a whirlwind and that, that's going on inside of them that they, they can't sort out, uh, they can't make sense of. And I believe that uh, this is why so many children today are having so many emotional problems that were... Uh, virtually uh, rare to virtually non-existent, Jeff, when I was a kid. Um, for example, I asked people my age, 
Do you remember anyone in your high school during the years that you were there, presumably four years, do you remember anyone who committed suicide? And um, the answer is, is no. I, I have, Jeff, I've never come across a person my age or thereabouts who remembers a high school classmate committing suicide. Uh, do you remember any girls starving themselves to the point of hospitalization? No, John, no, that's, no, there were no, there was nobody starving themselves. We ate what was put in front of us. Um, do you remember anybody who had to leave school and uh, be put into a rehab program of some sort because of alcohol use, drug use, uh, nervous breakdown, anything of that sort? No, John, no, that, that didn't happen. And I have asked these, I, I have related this in front of audiences of 500 to 1,000 people. I've asked these audiences, raise your hand if you're my age and know those 65 to whatever, right. and you remember someone in your high school class committing suicide, nobody raises a hand. You know, and, and the, the tragedy, I mean, here, here's the, here's the, uh, the uh, 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 unbelievable irony of this is that we have been listening to mental health professionals tell us how to deal with children since, call it 1970, and the mental health of children has been as the number, the per capita number of mental health professionals who advertise themselves as experts in child and adolescent mental health has increased exponentially over that same period of time. The mental health of children has gone into the toilet. Mm -hmm. It's completely in the toilet. And... Uh, there is no explanation for this, Jeff, that makes any sense other than we were sold, we being the American public, we were sold by well-intentioned people who believed in what they were selling, a uh, child-rearing paradigm that has proven itself to be completely bankrupt and counterproductive to the mental health of children. This is a hard thing for Americans, parents to wrap their heads around be, because there's this awful A-W-E-F-U-L mm -hmm. reverence for people with capital letters after their names right. in this country. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we call these people, you know, doctor. We, you know, what, what do you do, Jim? Well, I'm a psychologist. Well, suddenly he becomes doctor right. so-and-so. And it's it's hard for people to believe when I tell them no psychological theory concerning, none, no psychological theory concerning human nature has ever been verified by a consistent body of research. Right. Psychology, I call it, I'll keep reminding our audience of this. I am one licensed by the North Carolina Psychology Board. They regret the day they ever gave me a license. But, <laughs> you know, uh, they, they have never been able to prove the reason I still have a license. They have never been able to prove that I am wrong about anything I say about them their theories, and this new parenting paradigm that they foisted on the American public in the late 60s, early 70s, the uh, psychology is a fake science. There is nothing about it that qualifies as a science. Uh, it peddles fake diagnoses. These diagnoses are not realities, as is leukemia, cancer, high blood pressure. Those are measurable. Right. You know, I have high blood pressure. Well, what is your blood pressure? Well, it's 160 over 110. 
okay, you have high blood pressure, but ADHD, what is that? It's a construct. It's not measurable. It's a construct completely. Right. These are fake diagnoses that are held up to be equivalent to medical diagnoses when right. they are not. Yeah. Yeah. You can't they're, measure they're, you you can't measure what's going on in a person's brain empirically. You no. can form theories and you can try to assign some type of causality, right? But there's no way to uh, you know, actually measure what something is or what something isn't. Well, if someone says to a parent, your child has childhood leukemia, and the parent says, uh, prove it, uh, it can be proven. Right. It can be proven with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the results of blood tests uh, and, and, other, and other means. Um, it can be proven objectively, scientifically, mm -hmm. medically. If someone says, your child has... Note the use of the same verb, has. If someone says your child has ADHD and the parent says prove it, the diagnosing psychologist can offer the parent no objective evidence whatsoever that right. would verify that there is something abnormal existing in the child's biochemistry or neurology, none whatsoever. These right. are constructs. Right. They're they can just they can just look at whatever they think the quote unquote symptoms are. Right. And then try to apply that to the theories that were constructed by other people who have looked at this in the past. Yeah. 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 Let me. So, yeah. So there are two things that you said there, I think is important. Number one is a lack of critical thinking on the behalf of the American people putting too much trust and effort in, or too much trust into the letters behind people's names uh, when not realizing really what's going on there, that that's not a hard science. That's, that's theoretical. And even though you're taking things that may have in the, uh, in the past been based on, but even still based on theories from the past, you're taking those things and now making, you know, ed, quote unquote, advancing the knowledge number one. Number two, I want to throw something by you and see what you think about it. Because it seems to me that there was a shift of focus back in the self-esteem time, 70s, 60s, 70s, where there was a, a, a renewed focus on the self. Um, I grew up in a Christian background. Um, I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis and the idea of really, and I think his quote is something to the effect of, hey, don't think about yourself. You pretty much forget about yourself and really think of other people. When I was growing up, I didn't think about myself. I, and I think that's part of the way my parents brought me up. I just, you know, the the what you said about going introspecting and trying to find out my self-esteem and trying to figure out why I was feeling bad and the concentration on my emotional states and all of that. I think there's a lot of credence to what you're saying there. And I just think that there was this shift away from a traditional, maybe you would call it a Judeo-Christian ethic and that philosophy that goes along with it, where people now, when that's taken out of the equation, what what do you have to look at? You look inward, you look at yourself, you start to examine yourself and try to figure out where you were. Um, and then down the road, that has led to what you just said there about the overemphasis on your feelings and your emotional states, which are, which are not trustworthy, right? Which can change if you're hungry or if you're you know, thirsty or, or didn't get enough sleep, you can be in an emotional state. And now you're trying to look at what the cause is. You're not thinking that, oh, it's because of I had a bad lunch or something like that. And now that there's an overemphasis on those thoughts, um, we're in this situation that we're in now where it is the self-esteem and everybody's trying to placate that and everybody's trying to make people feel good about themselves. When in the past, it was just, I'm not even really thinking about myself. And there was never that emphasis. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and that, that is the biblical point of view. Uh, when Jesus uh, answers the, uh, 
the the person challenging him and, and asking what is the greatest first and greatest commandment uh he doesn't say the first and greatest commandment is to love yourself he says lo love god right and the second is it, not even having been asked for the second he says the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself and many people think that's permission to love yourself. No, what he is saying is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Can you do that? It's almost like he is issuing a challenge. Mm -hmm. And this was the this was the understanding in the Judeo-Christian world, Jeff, as you well know, that prevailed for thousands of years. That you were were not the center of the universe. Sorry right. to tell you, um, you were not the center of the universe. You were not all important. What was important was how you treated other people. Mm -hmm. And that's the ethic that I was raised within. You and I are probably a generation apart, but, you know, that was the understanding. I mean, I would come home and I would start talking to my mother about something. My mother was a single parent for most of the first seven years of my life. And even after she remarried, I was sort of in the habit of any time I would, you know, have something to talk about, whatever it was, I would go to her, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my mother telling me, uh, you're you're thinking about yourself too much. Mm -hmm. Um I remember my mother telling me when I would start complaining about something, uh, you know, how I was being treated on the playground or whatever. Uh, my mother saying, well, that that's just ridiculous. Uh, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. One of the things, <laughs> I say that to people my age and they laugh and say, well, I heard the same stuff from my parents, right. John. You know, our parents corrected our feeling states. When right. we weren't feeling correctly, and I tell parents all the time, look, there is correct and incorrect behavior, there is correct and incorrect thinking, and there is correct and incorrect feeling. And we have forgotten the third. We think that all feelings are valid, uh, meaningful, uh, significant, need to be talked about, need to be acknowledged need to be affirmed and all these new words, when in fact, no, from the Bible's very perspective, parents are to correct their children's feelings. Proverbs twenty two fifteen, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, goes on to say what is sometimes misinterpreted to mean you, you need to beat this out of them, when in fact, what it's what the verse is saying is your authority in your child's life is necessary to help your child sort out this chaos, this emotional chaos that is natural to a child, this this foolishness. And parents used to understand this intuitively, even parents who weren't uh, committed to a Judeo-Christian ethic ostensibly understood this. And, and and the mental health of children in America was 10 times better as a consequence of it. Uh, that's a great segue, because the reason we connected was I read online uh, one of your articles on friendship versus leadership. Um, and talk a little bit about the, ro the, the role that a parent should take for uh, good mental health or a solid emotional development. I think that's really smart to say there's good thinking, bad thinking, good action, bad thinking, good, good feeling and bad feelings. But your point is like, we don't ever really correct feelings. Feelings are always affirmed. They're a reality for whatever they're the, 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 the child is, is experiencing at the time, and they always must be affirmed rather than corrected. So talk about that leadership role versus a friendship role and the, 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 the power uh, that the role a parent takes in their parenting and in their ch child's life and how that is beneficial for their child, because I don't think a lot of people understand that. 
Uh, it used to be intuitively understood that uh, proper parenting was a matter of balancing uh, the delivery of authority and the delivery of love. Uh, you loved your child unconditionally and you exercised unequivocal authority over him because he was uh, incapable of loving himself properly and he was incapable of providing proper authority to himself. So parents were to do that. And it was understood that parenting was a leadership function that your job was to lead your child out of uh, childhood and adolescence and into a meaningful functional adulthood. And once your child became an adult, the affirmation of that was your child emancipated. In 1970, the average age of male emancipation in America, which is how emancipation has been measured up until recently, was uh, between the 20th and 21st birthdays. And emancipation was uh, defined as completely financially independent and living in your own residence, not one provided by your parents or you know, your, your, uh, your aunt, your uncle or anything else like that. Um, today, the average age of emancipation of the male in America, according to those standards, is around 28. So in the last 50 years, 53 years, the average age of male emancipation has increased uh, by nearly eight years during a time when America was the economic engine of the world. And the only explanation, I call this a uh, canary in the coal mine. You know, what is it that is preventing people from doing what generations of people, specifically males, did without any degree of difficulty? You know, when I went off to college, I regarded myself as emancipated. Right. I mean, and my parents regarded me as emancipated. They were still paying bills, but... In a phenomenological sense, Jeff, I was emancipated. I didn't call my parents every night. I didn't uh, call them once a week. Right. I didn't go home during breaks. Me and buddies would hop on a train or just use our thumbs and we would go, you know, to some place. We would go from central Illinois to Washington, D.C., you know, and I, I went to see, you know, uh, uh, Wilson Pickett in concert in uh, uh, at the Apollo Theater, the Harlem Theater in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I'm telling you this because there was this tremendous independence that we enjoyed and relished when we left our parents' homes to go to college, into the military, into the workforce, whatever it was. We were ready for adulthood. Our parents had done their job and they had done their job because they understood that their job was to lead. And in the early 1970s, that shifted along with the general paradigm shift that took place in child rearing to the understanding that your job as a parent was to have a wonderful relationship with your child. Mm -hmm. And now is where people begin to misunderstand me, because I'll, I'll say this proactively. People, after hearing what I'm about to say, will come up to me and go, well, John, we're not supposed to have a relationship with our kids. Right. No, no I'm not saying that. I'm saying that your primary function is not to have a wonderful relationship. Your primary responsibility and function is to provide proper leadership to your child. And if you provide proper leadership to a child, it is my contention, borne out by all of the historical evidence, that a relationship, a very satisfactory, mutually satisfying relationship will follow from this leadership that you provide. You know, and proper leadership is not yelling and screaming. Proper authority is not yelling and screaming. 
Proper leadership and proper authority is not constituted of proper punishment. It is, it is constituted of a calm provision of proper direction to a child. This is what you are supposed to do. Well, I don't want to. Well, whether you want to or not is irrelevant. You will. And you will do it not because I will be happier if you do it. You will do it because you will be a better person. And you will experience more personal satisfaction if you do it. And people don't, people don't understand that all of the good research into child rearing outcomes verifies that probably the number one variable in a child's happiness is obedience. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, think about it. Have you ever known an obedient child who was unhappy? Right. No. Obedient children are happy. And they're not obedient. They, they are not happy before they are obedient. They are obedient before they are happy. They realize, you know, it is a child's natural tendency to disobey. And you see this in the toddler. You know, you're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. I'm not going to. It's a toddler. And uh, we have, because we no longer understand our obligation to children, part of which is to cause them to obey, not fearfully, but willingly. There may be some fear involved at some point in time, points in time, but basically it is to lead a child to the intuitive understanding, okay, when I obey my parents, when I obey my teachers, when I obey other adults in positions of legitimate authority, I feel better. Right. I feel okay. I feel good. I feel like I'm doing the right thing. And children become, I will use the term, addicted to this. They become addicted to obedience. And they are happier as a result of it. And that's our responsibility to children. And that is provided not through cultivation of a wonderful relationship. It is cultivated through the proper provision of leadership to a child. So I was talking earlier about these uh, polls that I conduct in certain demographics. And um, again, among people my age, late 60s, 70s, 80s, etc. cetera, uh, I ask, uh, do you think that your parents were uh, significantly uh, focused on cultivating a wonderful relationship with you? And again, Jeff, the response is laughter. <laughs> no, John, my parents weren't really interested in having a wonderful relationship right. with me. Uh, they had a, a, a great relationship with each other, and uh, they, uh, they had friends, and um, my dad was, uh, he was, he was a wonderful role model for me, uh, but he did not see his primary obligation in his family as being a good dad. He saw his primary obligation as being a good husband, which segues into another aspect of this conversation that we really ought to touch upon. And that is that today's parents, probably the most fundamental mistake they are making is once they have children, they are occupying primarily in perpetuity the roles of mom and dad. And people in my generation will attest overwhelmingly that we understood intuitively that those two people within our families were functioning primarily as husband and wife. Right. Your dad did not come home to play with you. He came home to be with his wife, who had prepared for his re-entry into the home 
for at least an hour before he got there. She took a bath. She changed her clothes. She did her hair. I mean, it, we saw this. We saw this woman uh, who had been our mother all day transform herself into a wife before our fathers came home. And our fathers came home not to get down on the floor and build Lego castles with us. They came home to be with her. And right. what, a, what a wonderful uh, state of circumstances that was. I maintain that my generation is really the last generation of children in America to, as we were growing up, see what a marriage should look like. Now, you know, there are people in the audience who go, well, my parents' marriage was really bad. John. Well, yeah, there are exceptions to everything I say. But overwhelmingly, people in my generation will say, our parents' marriage was, it was okay to great. Uh, there are those who will say, well, my parents shouldn't have stayed married. But that'll be a minority of people. And even those people who grew up where the, the, the marriage was dysfunctional will say, you know, I learned a lot about how to be properly married from seeing two people who were improperly married. Right. You know, but it was clear to all of us that these two people were not functioning primarily as mom and dad. They didn't see that as their primary roles. They saw husband and wife as their primary roles. Mm -hmm. And that's well, once, yeah, you're once again just kind of articulating the shift from an outward or other centered person to yourself. And, you know, again, um, I, I was, I was uh, thinking about the, the perspective that when that, when that shift came and it was more of of centered around being a parent versus being a uh, a partner right a partner to somebody and that out of that partnership um the right ordering of authority the authority structure and you know i don't want to get into like the patriarchy and all that stuff, but like there was a, a right ordering and everybody kind of understood what their role was. And that is what kind of led to that obedience perspective that we, we know where we're supposed to be. We're secure in ourselves instead of today where you have a kid, you know, it's, it's, it's baffling to me that you can have a child tell his parent at age six, that no, I'm not this gender, I'm this gender. And the parent will go, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah, you're right. Like, where did, how did we get to the point where, you know, I remember, and I use this example multiple times. I was, I don't know, 17, 16, and I came home and um, everybody was getting earrings in their ear you know, my friends were, and I, I, I was walking around the house looking for a needle. And my dad goes, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm going to pierce my ear. And he said, no, you're not, or you can leave this house, <laughs> you know? And so it was kind of like, okay. And, and I, you know, like at that point, I, I knew where my role was and I knew what my dad's role was. And I respected that. And I understood that here we're just, the, 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 there's been a huge shift in our, in our, in our culture. And um, it's disturbing. Affirming a child's feelings has become more important than uh, correcting behavior. It's so, the gospel now. Yeah. So my daughter uh, and, and my daughter uh, works for me. She uh, works for me full time. She runs my website. She runs, I tell her, your job is to run my life because I don't want to. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so our roles paradoxically have almost shifted. Right. Um, but uh, she came to me when she was, I don't know, five years old. And she said um, that uh, she had decided that she was a boy. And uh, she had a boy name for herself. I forgot what it, forget what it was, but um, she was sitting, sitting there talking to me and she said, I'm a boy now. 
um, my name is, and I want you to call me this name. And I said uh, to her, I tell you what, um, you're not a boy, you're a girl. But if you want to be a boy, you can be a boy in your room. But uh, you can do anything you want in your room. You can close your door and you can be a boy. But when you come out of your room, you are Amy, you are my daughter, you are a girl. And until you're ready to be Amy, you can't come out of your room. And that was the end of it right there. Mm -hmm. There was no more, I'm a boy. Today's parents would sit down and, and well, how, tell me about the feeling that you're having, you know? I had a, I mean, th these are irrational feelings. I had a conversation with a 17 year old girl who gave her parents as her graduation gift from high school. On the day she graduates from high school, she tells her parents that uh, they have not raised a girl, they have raised a boy. And that it's time that they knew that. So the parents come to me and they say, John, we want you to talk to her. And I said, I'm not going to try and talk her out of it. I, I, you know, that is not what I'm going to try and do. But I will try and understand this. And so that maybe I can help you better understand it and respond to it functionally. So I sat down with the girl and I said, uh, so tell me, uh, do you have any male biological characteristics? She said, no. I said, well, what then uh, has convinced you that uh, you are a male? Her answer, well, your gender is not a matter of biology. Your gender is a matter of alarm bells go off, your feelings. And I said, uh, okay, well, explain that. She said, well, I feel like a boy. I said, well, that's very interesting. How does a boy feel? And she looks at me like a deer in the headlights. And she says, well, boys feel different. I said, well, yeah, I understand that you're telling me that, but how does a boy feel? Well, boys are interested in different things. I said, well, not all boys. I said, I, I know plenty of men who are not interested in sports, for example. I'm not interested in sports. Uh, but uh, I, I don't feel like that compromises my masculinity in any way. So uh, explain to me uh, how, how this is. Well, it's just that boys, boys think differently. And I decided, okay, th this is completely non-productive. So I said, well, let right. me ask you a question. Um, if I was to tell you what I have never told anyone else, and that is that I am not a human being, I am a squirrel, uh, how would you respond to that? And she looked at me and she said, uh, well, that's different. I said, no, it's not different at all. If biology doesn't define gender, then why does biology define species? And her response, I'm not going to talk to you about this anymore. Right. Well, because what I had done was follow the logical train of her thought processes, and she was unwilling to deal in any intellectually honest way with that logical train. So, you know, I say to people, this is irrational. It's, it, but here's the problem, Jeff, as you realize you're a head of school, you've dealt with this. It has become politically incorrect to say that these people are irrational. It has become politically incorrect to say that these people aren't thinking straight. You know, you're, you're an oppressor if you suggest that this is in some way, shape, or form an expression of faulty thinking right. and faulty emotion. The um, Once again, feelings are the empirical science in that sense. It, yeah. it's the it's the feelings that are validated above above a science who can argue with someone's feelings um if if that's your if that's your feelings you know that that's the truth um and your point about you're not <laughs> i remember i think it was james dobson wrote a book or something like that it was something about you can't trust your emotions emotions can you trust them or something like that and it just kind of gave me a perspective on you know, what exactly are, 
what exactly are we doing when we when we are validating a feeling or an emotion and your point there about the the differences between who are who are you to say what a boy feels or a boy doesn't feel who are you to say what a girl feels or a girl doesn't feel there's a vast range of feelings and emotions that every human being has and they're not constrained necessarily to particular genders right so um, I don't, we've been talking for a bit. I wonder if you might say, what are the best tips that you can give to a parent today? Somebody that's having a baby or getting ready to have a baby or has a, a young child. Um, I, I, maybe if, if people look at or listen to what you said about uh, where are the students, uh, where are our children's and our young people's mental health has gone over listening to the experts for the past 50 years um, and looking at the, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the battlefield of distraught and distressed and stressful and anxious uh, people that are growing up. What are, I don't know, the top three, top five things that you could say, here's the things that you can do to kind of ensure uh, as best as you can a, a healthy child. And I, you, I know you've got it in your books and you've got multiple points, but what, what might you suggest there? Uh, number one, stop paying so much attention to your children. Stop uh, assigning so much credence to everything that they say, uh, everything that they do. Um, you know, children... Uh, need a lot of guidance and direction. And um, uh, what they don't need is what the mental health professions have said they do need uh, for the last 50 years. Uh, this was never an understanding before then. Uh, the mental health profession said the children need a lot of attention. No, they don't. They need some. They need a minimal amount. And like anything else, uh, protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. Everything consumed, whether it's material or immaterial, as in the case of attention, uh, you reach a point of diminishing returns. Today's children are just, because their parents are occupying primarily within their families, not the roles that God has assigned to them, but the roles that the world has assigned to them, mom and dad, uh, they believe that good parenting is all about paying attention to your kids. So my stepfather never came home with the intention of playing with me, although he did occasionally. Hey, go get a couple of mitts. Let's go play catch in the backyard. You right. know, kind of thing. But this was not something that I expected on a daily basis. You know, um, today's parents are occupying the roles of mom and dad 24-7, 365, and they believe that good parenting is all about paying attention to your child. So what they end up doing is paying a lot of attention to things that they shouldn't be paying any attention to at all, that they should be minimizing. Like my mother saying to me, oh, this is ridiculous. I, I, I've got things to do. I don't have time to talk to you about ridiculous things like this. You know, you uh, if, if you're upset at how... Uh, at the fact that the kids aren't sharing the baseball with you, if they're not throwing it to you as much as they're throwing it to one another, go out there and figure it out with them. Don't come in here and complain to me about it. I've got things to do. <laughs> you know, that was the way children were talked to mm -hmm. 60, 70 years ago. You know, we were dismissed if we did not bring to our parents valid concerns then we were dismissed. And we weren't dismissed politely. Mm -hmm. We were simply dismissed. You know, I don't have time to talk to you about this. This is ridiculous. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. What do you expect me to do about this? This is you and your friends. I am not 13 years old. I am 40. I am not going to get out there and try and solve your problems. But, but they do now. Yeah, but, but they, they do all of this. Now, you know, they, mom's right. going out right now. Mom's going out and saying, you know, screaming at everybody. 
you better throw the kid, you better throw the ball to my kid. You know, yeah. that's the and, difference. And she now. stands behind her child to make sure that the ball, all right, it's my, it's Billy's turn now, throw the ball to Billy, you know. Right. Uh, it's, uh, you know, because, and we, and we could go into this, Jeff, the, the, this could be the topic of another podcast, if you're willing, is the Good Mommy Club, which is this uh, secret sisterhood in America uh, that, that rules how mothers relate to their children. And one of the understandings of the Good Mommy Club is that the Good Mommy solves all of her child's problems, all of them. She solves his peer group problems. She solves his sibling problems. She solves his problems at school. She solves the problem. If, you know, my I came home, <laughs> I was, uh, I don't know, I was in the fifth grade. And I came home and I told my mother that one of my teachers obviously didn't like me. And I really don't know what I expected my mother to do, but I expected her to do something, you know. And, and I, so I come home and I said, uh, you know, Mr. Franklin, he, he, he doesn't like me, mom, you know. Uh, and I think I said something like, don't expect me to get a good grade uh, from Mr. Franklin because he doesn't like me. And she looked at me and she said, uh, it is high time that you learned how to deal with pre people who don't like you because you're going to encounter these people for the rest of your life. <laughs> right. So it is a, a good thing that uh, you're having to deal with this. Uh, you were going to have to deal with it sooner or later. Uh, and uh, uh, good that you're having to deal with it sooner. And um, she said, uh, I have no intention of uh, going to the school on your behalf and talking to Mr. Franklin. And furthermore, you had better get a good grade from him. Uh, the fact that he doesn't like you is no excuse for you to get a bad grade. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell, and people are like, you know, wow, <laughs> you know, your mother was really, she had no feelings. She was mean. <laughs> And my mother was very affectionate and approachable and funny. But right. when it came time to deliver a dose of reality and a dose of authority, my mother stood up to the plate. Right. And today's mothers and fathers are following suit because you mentioned the word patriarchy before. Oh, uh, well, today's family, when it comes to the raising of children, is obviously a matriarchy. The mother is right. running the parenting show, and the father is just meekly going along with it. Um, I mean, I, I, I could have, uh, we could have another podcast on, you know, the destruction of authentic fatherhood in America. Right. But, um, yeah, women used to be feared in the biblical sense by their children mm -hmm. you know i was afraid of my mother not because i mean she never spanked me she never hit me she never screamed at me uh, my mother never hardly ever raised her voice but she possessed her authority and that is intimidating to a child Right. Uh, and you and and, you know, to the average American, the world, the word intimidate carries negative connotations. Mm -hmm. But in this context, it's a very positive thing that you are intimidated by this person and therefore you pay attention. And you do what you're told. And all of that comes back to you in riches. Mm hmm. And the Bible says this, mm -hmm. you know, obedience is a good thing. It's a good thing to accept discipline for the person who's accepting it. Doesn't that also provide a sense of stability and security for the child? They know, they trust, they recognize their place. Absolutely. The child understands because his parents are, they, they embrace their responsibility to be, to provide proper authority because they embrace it. Mm -hmm. The child understands intuitively, these are powerful people who are capable of taking care of me, providing for me, protecting me, 
under any and all circumstances. And what a wonderful thing for a child to understand. And the child does not have to like his parents' decisions in order for right. him to understand that. Today's parents are so worried that their children won't like them right. that they try to please their children. I mean, this is insane, actually, you know, that in 50 years, we've gone from the understanding that it's the child's job to please the parent to the implied, implicit understanding that it's the parent's job to please the child. I mean, it's insane. Right. Um, let me ask you one more question. One of the things that we're trying to build is some type of a proactive approach to help our students who have been, you know, maybe the word is conditioned over the way that they've been brought up uh, to not be able to handle the difficulties and the common stresses that people of previous generations just kind of managed. You know, we didn't have uh, the mental health challenges and things that our students are growing up with today. And I think we have a good uh, b foundation based on what we've talked on about for the reasons by which that is the case. Is it too late for parents whose kids are have maybe not got it right or who are struggling now as a result of some of these things? in the society or even in their own raising of the kids? Is it too late? And what can be done? Um, we're trying to figure out instead of when our students are coming to the counselor with their problems because Johnny took their straw at lunch or something like that and they can't manage it and handle it, we're trying to come up with some type of a proactive approach that we can teach some type of something that we can teach our students from the earliest ages on how to be resilient, on how to, uh, you know, have the fortitude to be able to handle those things. The reality is you're going to go out into the world and it's not a great place. Not everybody's going to come rescuing mm -hmm. you. Not everybody's going to come and pull you out of the fetal position in the corner. You've got to be able to deal with those things if you're going to be a functional adult. So is it too late for parents? And what are maybe some strategies that parents can take or that even us as a school can take to put our students in a better position? It's not too late. Uh, I... I talked yesterday to the parents of a 16 year old. And a lot of what I do when I do parent counseling, uh, Jeff, I don't do what's called therapy because I'm not focusing on feelings and I'm, I'm not doing what I call psychological archeology, span going back into the childhood of the parents, how you were raised and your father was an alcoholic and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I do, is I develop scripts for parents because what I've under, what what I've understood, what I understand more than anything else is that today's parents don't know how to talk to children. Right. You know, they don't know how to talk. They think that everything, every experience they have with their child needs to be positive. In other words, that the child needs to walk away from it going, by golly, I've got great parents, don't I? And so what I do is help parents understand what, what you want parents to understand. And that is that in order to develop emotional resilience, which research, as you know, has found is the, with a capital T, capital H, capital E, key to good mental health, emotional resilience, the ability to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune um, that the child has to be confronted with what he did wrong, his responsibility in creating the circumstances that he's complaining about, uh, his responsibility to solve the problem himself, his responsibility to come to grips with the fact that not everyone and every experience that he has is going to be self-affirming that he's going to have to deal with a bunch of fill in the blank in his life. And it's time that he began developing those skills now. And so what I do is I help parents uh, learn how to talk to their children. So uh, yesterday with the parents of a 16 year old, you know, who are dealing with the 16 year old lying a lot. Why one reason she's lying 
is because every time she lies, the parents, you know, they they go bonkers. You know, how would this be happening? And, you know, it's it's they're questioning their ability to be good parents. They're questioning the child's salvation, et cetera, et cetera. And what I did was simply talk them how to talk, how to respond to this when the child lies. You know, mm -hmm. instead of sitting down and having a moral and theological conversation, I said, how about sitting down with her and just saying, all we got to say is this, you've lied once again, and we hope for your sake that you don't take this habit outside this house into adulthood. That's all we've got to say. Do you want to say anything? Because if you don't, it's fine. And get up and walk away. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, it's like guerrilla parenting, you know? Right. It's like, get in and get out. You know, mm -hmm. stop having these these. 30 minute conversations about morality, the future consequences of this, the theology of this, uh, its uh, relationship to the fifth commandment or whatever commandment it was, uh, and, and so on and so forth. After a while, your child just hears blah, blah, blah. Say what you have to say in 50 words or less and stop. Mm -hmm. And before you sit down, just think about how can I express what I want to express in the fewest words possible? I mean, this is one approach of many that I take. But one thing that I do that I have found is very, very effective with today's parents is just giving them scripts and teaching them how to talk to their kids uh, about uh, whatever, you know, whatever. Well, my child comes to me and and tells me this and this, he's having these feelings. And, and uh, I said, well, what have you, what have you done before? Well, we've, we've talked, we've talked about, you know, we've tried to get to the bottom of this fear, this anxiety, and so on. And um, I said, well, here, how about this? And how long have you been doing this? Well, we've been doing it for five years now, John, because this started when he was three years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, so the definition of insanity is continuing mm -hmm. to do the same thing, even you, you know, even though it's not working, expecting right. different outcomes. So I said, "How about this? How about this? When the next time he comes to you and complains of this anxiety, just look at him and say, you know what? I've said all I have to say about this. I have nothing more to say about it. So uh, I've got the dishes to do, and you've got your homework to do. See you later." <laughs> <laughs> And the amazing thing is that parents who do this, who who put this into practice, I, I mean, Jeff, I, I'll say this. It's not, you know, none of my ideas are my ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, that 100% of the time, these parents come back and go, John, it's amazing he is no longer coming to us and complaining about this anxiety. Right. And all we have done is simply look at him and go, what do you expect me to say that I haven't said before? Right. I don't have any other words. I've used them all up. Don't you have homework to do? Right. You well, know. isn't that like, isn't that putting this, the, the, the child in a position to figure it out themselves when it's not a crisis situation, right. you know, like to go back to your room and figure it out. This isn't a crisis. You're not going to die. You're not, you know, we're not talking about a life and death issue. This is something that, you know, you can figure that out and you just kind of give them the freedom to be able to figure that out. Right. Yeah, it's empowering to a child, you know, and, and again, the child walks away from that encounter, you know, the first time he hears those words from his parents, he, you know, he walks away and he stomps his feet and he says, you're mean, you don't, you don't care about me, you don't love me. And yeah, uh, and, and if you can get past that, you can get to some really wonderful territory, which you should have been in in the first place, you know. Well, it's, that's incredible. And um I do want to uh, see if there's a way where our audience can reach you. Um, I don't know. I know we connected on LinkedIn and I'm assuming it was your assistant. Was that your daughter uh, that's running that? 